expected viewers, audience, participants. On behalf of the ICOF Secretariat, it is with great feeling that we welcome you all to the third week of Fort Diplomacy Academy. I am greatly honored to have this opportunity to moderate this session, and I would like to mention that we are very pleased to have for today's session a notable guest speaker, Dr. Ravza Kavakci, a parliament member of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. Before we kick off the session, let me introduce myself. I am indeed your humble moderator, Farid Zakir, from the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a professional officer at the Department of Foreign Affairs at ICOF Secretariat in Istanbul, Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, ICOF has launched several webinar training courses and online series starts intended to empower the youth since the onset of the pandemic. Hence, one of the most prominent projects is the Diplomacy Academy, which offers seven weeks of academic seminars and designed by ICYF to enhance the diplomatic skills of the youth and enlighten their visions regarding global issues. Further to that, ICYF successfully launched three Diplomacy Academy programs until now, and Fort Diplomacy Academy this year received 1,200 applications from 83 different countries. Distinguished guests, dear respected viewers, audience, participants, today's session is centered on parliamentary diplomacy. Our esteemed speaker will have 30 minutes to deliver her speech. And after that, I will open the floor for a Q&A session. In the same connection, I would like to kindly request from our participants to share their questions via chat box, and I will relate them. But before that, Dr. Kavakci, please permit me to read your biography to our audience. Dr. Ravza Kavakci Khan holds a PhD in political science from Howard University in Washington, DC. She has an MA degree in European Studies from Boise University and BS degree in Software Engineering from University of Texas at Dallas. After completing her undergraduate degree, she worked in Belmim Company and the Project Department of Istanbul Ulashim Company and lectured at Hassan Kalyonju University. She was a member of Advisory Board of Center for Postcolonial Studies. Dr. Kavachi was elected as a member of Parliament of Istanbul from AK Party for the 25th legislative term of Grand National Assembly of the Republic of Turkey. She was re-elected for the 26th term of November 1st, 2015 and 27th term on the 24th of June, 2018. Respectively, she served as the Vice Chair of AK Party in charge of human rights and was a member of the Central Decision and Executive Board of AK Party for three terms between 2015 and 2018. She was the head of Turkey-China Interparliamentary Friendship Group and president of the Roundtable for Parliamentarians of the United Nations Conventions to Combat Desertifications. She served as a member of the Committee on Foreign Relations and the Committee on EU Harmonization in the Grand National Assembly of the Republic of Turkey. She has been elected as the president of the Turkish Interparliamentary Union Group for the 27th legislative term of Grand National Assembly of Turkey and is a member of the Committee on Digital Platforms that is newly established. Without further ado, I would like to give the virtual floor to our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Kavakci, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear brother Ferit Zakir, for this nice, kind introduction. Uh, yeah. And it's my great pleasure, great honor to be with you uh, here uh, uh, on the, uh, upon the invitation of ICYF. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, diplomacy Academy. So we will be talking a lot about diplomacy and a lot uh, about parliamentary diplomacy, hopefully today. Uh, one of my passions in life is being with youth. And sometimes I do it of interest, uh, my own interest, because whenever I'm with young people, I learn a lot and I get a lot of energy, which is something we need when you're in politics. You need to be like an... Um, you have constant energy and never, never stop because it's a work that goes 24-7 uh, uh, and there is absolutely no time sometimes to take a break. So I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to be among young people. I hope I'll be, uh, I'll try to share my, some of my experience and I hope I'll be learning from you when we get to the question and answer part a little later. 
of course uh, what, when uh, before uh, as i was preparing earlier today for the for the lecture uh, i looked at the meaning of diplomacy of i'm sure this is something that came up in the previous lectures but uh, it, when i looked online britannica uh, defines diplomacy to be uh, established method of foreign governments and peoples uh, through dialogue, negotiations, and other measures uh, short of war or violence. So it's a way of communication, uh, but a form of communication uh, between uh, in, an, in the international arena uh, where uh, there is uh, the type of communication is doesn't consist, consist of violence. It's a peaceful type of communication, we can say. Of course, historically, uh, we talk about uh, communication between today, we talk about communication between nation states. And for those of you who are students of social sciences or graduates of uh, areas related with social sciences, there is always the question of international institutions, how effective they are. Of course, we know that when we look at modern world history, we uh, we there was a time where we had empires and the empires were uh, the time of empires were uh, up and then nation states were formed and then now we talk about international organizations intergovernmental organizations we talk about supranational organizations like the european union and i'm sorry and um and we talk about uh, whether international organizations like the united nations are effective in the international arena so there is lots of questions for students of of social sciences when we talk about that is how how do we do diplomacy through these organizations of course today uh, after nation states we talked about multinational corporations they are a fact of international politics uh, so uh, who who has the power in the international arena of course, for young people, another area and an area that I'm studying as well is as, as part of the member of the recently established uh, committee on digital platforms, uh, another form of power that we see in the international arena is digital platforms. So how do digital platforms affect uh, affect people's thoughts and people's behavior and how are they a part of diplomacy? How do they affect diplomacy? So I hope that maybe during our conversation today, we may be able to find some answers to some of these questions or talk about uh, what, what is the, what is the uh, current situation in the world. Uh, during the introduction, and again, thank you for the kind introduction, you did mention that I'm a member of the, uh, I'm the president of the Turkish group to the Interparliamentary Union. So I think when we talk about parliamentary diplomacy, we will talk about the IPU because it's a very, very good example. It's not a very heard of example. Even members of parliament in my own parliament, there are those who hadn't heard of IPU. So it's uh, my point, uh, one of my missions to talk to everybody about IPU, because although there is, we have a committee, we have a Turkish group and each parliament has their own group uh, that is involved in the parliamentary union, all members of parliament in each parliament that's a member of the IPU are considered natural members. So if we talk about Grand National Assembly of Turkey, we are 600 members uh, that are natural members to the IPU. But naturally, it is nine of us uh, that represent the Turkish parliament in the international meetings. But let me give you some information about the interparliamentary union. All of us have heard of the United Nations. We will set aside the question that I raised before, whether United Nations as an international organization, is it effective? Uh, is, it, uh, is there such a thing as international law? Uh, or is it something that sometimes some states use uh, against each other? Or is it effective? We will set that question aside. But ideally, 
imagining of United Nations as an international organization where almost all world states are recognized, world states are represented. World states, of course, governments are represented. I have to highlight the word government in that case. And uh, IPU is just the same as the United Nations, except it was established way before United Nations in 1889. And it, uh, it uh, with, uh, under the roof of the umbrella of the IPU, 179 member parliaments are represented. So I know that today we have many, many uh, members who are attending this diplomacy academy from many different nations. Please make a point after the lecture, see who, who in your parliament is representing the IPU, who is the president of your group, and which parties are being represented there, of course, and see if your state, or your parliament is a member of the IPU. Uh, so IPU was established in 1889, and all world, almost the whole world population is represented there through their members of parliament, through their groups. What makes IPU a little more special and a little more different than uh, the United Nations, which is a good example that we know, is because parliaments are represented. So it's not the government. So in the IPU, you have each parliament's leading party members and also opposition members. So I will give you an example from the Turkish Grand National Assembly. In the IPU, each nation is represented uh, according to their population. So as the Turkish group, uh, considering the Turkish population of 83, 84 million, we have nine seats. Normally it is eight, but because we have a young member as well, we have nine seats, nine votes in the IPU, uh, IPU General Assemblies. We are representing our uh, Grand National Assembly of Turkey. And within that nine, uh, the uh, again, depending on which party has more seats in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, from that nine, we are four members, including myself, from the ruling party, AK Party, and we have five members from the opposition, one, two members from the main opposition party, the Republican Party, HB in Turkey, and one member from MHP, one member from E party and one member from the HDP. So we're nine members, four of us are from the ruling party, nine is from the opposition parties uh, in, in the Turkish Grand National Assembly of Turkey. So uh, the representation is different from the United Nations, where not only the government or not only the party that is in government, it's also the opposition being represented. So that's one of the things that makes the IPU a little more special. When we look at the IPU membership, we see that there is uh, 193 countries around the world. 179 have our members of the IPU. There are members with, uh, there are pending applications and associate members. But there's more information about that online. I don't want to bore you with too much of details. Uh, but uh, out of these 193 uh, countries in the world, uh, 79 of them have uh, bicameral uh, parliaments and 113 are unicameral parliaments. And this is some information I wanted to share with you. Just like the Diplomacy Academy, from the information note, I've seen that you give importance, of course, you're all young people, uh, but you also give importance to women's representation. The Interparliamentary Union is very, very uh, careful about that as well, that both gender, both men and women are represented in each delegation. So uh, when we are to vote on a topic, uh, we have uh, votes registered if uh, we are a single gender delegation, then we lose some of our votes. So if, if, you, if three of the registered votes are going to be 
uh, administered toward the toward the voting period, then if 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 you have a single uh, sex generation uh, the, uh, delegation, then it is two votes that are registered. So they take one vote away from you. So you need to have both men and women represented in your delegations. And according to the IPU records, 25.5% of world's MPs are women. And uh, also 30.2% of world's MPs are young MPs, members of parliament. And internationally, globally, there are, are more than 46,000 members of parliament representing the global community. This is just some information. Of course, I do have to admit, I love IPU's definition of young because it suits me, because they believe, you may not believe, but they say that 45, under 45 is young. I love that. I'm above 45, way above 45, but I love that definition. But you and I, we all know that that's not really young, but I like their definition. So that is how they define young. It's important to note that as well. well IPU is one of the vacuums, one of the uh, incubators, one of the perfect places where we can talk about parliamentary diplomacy. Because as you know, what makes parliamentary diplomacy from in bet uh, diplomacy between minister at ministerial level or intergovernmental level is Members of parliament ideally uh, have more freedom of speech. So whatever the government says, they, they need to be more careful representatives of government, but members of parliament, just like we do in our national parliaments, may sometimes disagree, strongly disagree with each other, or are able to talk, speak our mind more fle freely in the international arena. So that's something I think all members of parliament like. Of course, we are still bound by our, the, the principles of our parties, but we are more flexible in speaking. If there is a misunderstanding in diplomatic relations uh, between governments, that may cause two governments to go to war. But when it's between members of parliament, we we may say, oh, it was it was a it was a it was a misunderstanding at parliamentary level. But of course, it is important during diplomacy to make sure that you use the la right language and you abide by the pro proper protocol. Uh, last week, I was at the Antalya Diplomacy Forum and uh, we were together with uh, a number of distinguished uh, foreign, uh, foreign relations secretaries uh from different countries so one of them said uh, that uh, when he became a minister of foreign relations people warned him he said they said you need to be careful about certain things of course within the diplomatic framework you need to be careful about what you say you need to be careful about what you eat and drink and you need to be careful about protocol rules. So those are the rules also in the international arena uh, that affect, uh, that apply to members of parliament as well. However, uh, like I said, it is more flexible for members of parliament. How is the parliamentary diplomacy in the IPU or in other areas? So how does it work when we, when we are in the international area, arena? Of course, we are able to talk together on many, many issues. But of course, uh, we have to, while we're speaking on any issue, we need to consider our national interest, our policies, our principles. And we need to see what, at what points we may come together on certain issues on common ground. This is not easy in the international arena. It's not easy at the United Nations, and it may be more and more challenging at an organization like the Interparliamentary Union because all parliaments are represented and sometimes certain groups have a hard time agreeing on issues within themselves. So when you look at the international arena, it becomes more challenging. So we have to decide between your international interest and uh, try to negotiate on certain issues and hoping that hoping that 
uh, you can come together, uh, which is which I like I mentioned is is a challenge sometimes. Of course, when we look at diplomacy, parliamentary diplomacy, we can talk about uh, bilateral relations. We can talk about relations within under the roof of different parliamentary groups. Just like the IPU, there are other parliamentary groups in the in the in our national assemblies. For instance, the group like a group like NATO parliamentary assembly, NATO parliamentary assembly, or a group that is under the umbrella of the IPU, like Asia parliamentary assembly or OICs parliamentary assembly, uh, organization of Islamic countries parliamentary assembly. So we have different members of parliament uh, leading the groups on those parliamentary assemblies as well. In the IPU, we also have geographic groups. That is one thing I wanted to also mention. There are six or seven geographic groups. And as Turkey, we're a member of the 12 plus group. Uh, 12 plus group is uh, consists of mostly Western European countries, EU member countries. It's, it consists of uh, 47 members, EU member countries, and then and then we have countries such as Israel and countries such as states such as Canada and Australia that has also represented in those groups. And Turkey happens to be the only Muslim majority country in that group. So what we do is we first meet as group. And whatever will be discussed on the uh, General Assembly, there are two General Assemblies each year of the IPU. Ideally, we meet face to face, but because of COVID restrictions and the pandemic pandemic that's ongoing, so we we have had our meetings online. But it is uh, our each group, the our group, twelve plus group, geographic group, and uh, the group on. Eurasia and different many other groups, uh, Latin America countries, the Grulak group, uh, all the groups meet together and decide what kind of a position they will take on certain issues or whether they will they will uh, be proposing an item in what we call an emergency item that should be something that should be a part of the agenda. It could be about environment. It could be about certain prices that's being uh, that's uh, ongoing in a certain area. So there is different types of activities. So we see parliamentary diplomacy in each level. First, we have to, again, going from the IPU example, we have to have some sort of diplomacy amongst ourselves because we're different parties representing our national assemblies. So we have to agree we have to constantly negotiate. We need to be in harmony with each other. So we won't be caught fighting in front of everybody. Uh, so we will be, we will have to agree on issues amongst our group. And then at the uh, geographic level, within our group, we have to negotiate on certain things. We may be uh, for or against the decision of our group. Of course, I, it's ideal when you're in an international organization to act together with your group, to take the support of your group or support your group yourself. But sometimes our national interest doesn't allow that. So that's also understandable. So we may be going against the group decision in that case. So that's another level. And at again, coming back to the IPU uh, example, then at the IPU level, uh, at the international or supranational level, then we have to agree on certain issues within the we have to negotiate issues that may be related with our group that may be related but with a with a, a state that we are working with we may be asked to support them on a certain issue or uh, we will need to negotiate with everybody else all other member parliaments in that area so it's a challenging job it's a very very exciting uh, a, a position or a or a job that keeps you uh, in constant uh, adrenaline, I will say, but it's also a high responsibility. So you need to make sure that although it's parliamentary diplomacy, sometimes a little a little more flexible than intergovernmental diplomacy, but still you have to be in constant. Uh, you need to be alert to make sure that. You don't miss anything, 
and you don't say uh, you don't uh, you make sure that you do not do anything that may be uh, against your national interest of course we can't know everything uh, we are we are members of parliament we all have our professions and we try to prepare for each meeting but sometimes there may be an issue that's related with an area that you have uh, not no expertise on so uh, that is when the wonderful wonderful uh, experts from our grand national assembly come to our rescue and they give us information on certain issues and we may ask for information from our foreign ministry and uh, those are we have experts there who who come to the rescue as well so it's a wonderful job to be a part of the parliamentary diplomacy yet uh, like i said it's also challenging uh, i know i'm earlier than maybe i i will stop earlier than we uh, we decide I'd give myself 20, 25 minutes because I would like to make it as uh, as interactive as possible. If if that's okay, I would love to listen to you. I had I have some more on my mind, but uh, I'll I'll say what I want to say as we as we go in the conversation. If it's okay, of course it's just okay, Doctor. Thank you very much. I would like to express my humble appreciation for your wonderful speech, uh, distinguished participants. I would like to kindly remind you that you can share your questions via the chat box and I will relate them. Uh, for now, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Astrid Nadia. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Ms. Astrid, can you hear us? Okay, then I would like to give the floor to Ms. Amina Kahriman. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Sometimes there's, this is one of the things that we uh, enjoy I will say we experienced during the COVID pandemic. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, we, like I mentioned, we have our online meetings, and then sometimes the speaker is unable to, unable yeah. to connect. So okay. that's that's one of the challenges. <laughs> uh, Ms. Amina Kahriman, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? I, I think, think we lost Amina Kahrima. <laughs> okay, then I would like to give the floor to Mr. Moiz Islami. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Mr. Moiz? Mr. Moiz, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Uh, uh, this is Abdul Moiz Islami, country coordinator of Model OIC, Moek for beloved Afghanistan. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rauda, for excellent lecture. We really enjoyed listening to it and especially myself learned a lot. And thanks uh, to you, ICYF, for such outstanding program, and special thanks uh, to our model OIC coordination team as well. I just wanted to ask uh, Your Excellency, uh, what are the differences between uh, representing your country as an elected MP and as an appointed diplomat? Like, how could we differentiate between being uh, as an elected MP, member of parliament, and as an appointed diplomat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Should I answer right away, uh, Brother Farid Zakir? Yeah, Uncle? yeah. You're okay, all right. Uh, this is a very good question. I was thinking when the question was coming, what is it 
like from being, the, what is the difference between being a civilian and a member of parliament? And the answer was ready, but this is more difficult than that. <laughs> because uh, I'll, I'll, if you like, I can reply to that as well. Um, of course, okay. when you're a, when, like I said, when you're a, when you're a diplomat, uh, it is you have your whatever you say is the word of the of the government. You cannot. There is no. There is no flexibility when you're an appointment this diplomat as as much. But when it is compared when it is compared to what a member of parliament may say. Let me give you an example. Sometimes uh, we, we hear members of parliament in the international arena saying things that, are, that may be offensive or that may be disrespectful or that may be uh, pushing the limits of respect, we can say. And when you make it an issue, uh, to uh, to someone from that country, to an official, they say, "Well, they're members of parliament. You know, we can." They say whatever they wish. It is, of course, you know, they have their political view, but also they may add in some personal opinion. But when it is uh, when it is uh, a bureaucrat, when somebody whose appointment, of course, I'm not talking about high level uh, appointees like. If it's if it's if it's a minister, but if it's somebody maybe um, in a different position, then it's what they say has to be official state language, official state uh, government view. So for the, for for members of parliament, like I said, it's more flexibility. But this is a good question that reminded me of something else. Uh, when we when we go and as as group. We were in the international arena. It is interesting that sometimes, I mean, this is the case of Turkey, sometimes that people understand uh, parliamentary diplomacy as diplomacy of the opposition members of parliament only. In some situations, some uh, platforms, only it's uh, sometimes we feel like only opposition's point of view is valued. So it's so. We need to work on it. So it's not opposition diplomacy. It's diplomacy, parliamentary diplomacy that includes both leading parties point of view and the opposition point of view. That's something, one of the things that I really, really like about the IPU is that all parties have a share, have a say. And I'll give you a secret. Like I said, we're five parties uh, being represented. Uh, representing the Turkish Grand National Assembly, uh, one opposition, one coalition party, and three uh, main opposition parties, one leading party. And except for one party, all of us act together. So we may be at almost, uh, we may be in the parliament uh, almost like fighting each other on certain issues. And my colleagues are very, very well versed uh, members of parliament, they are very strong opponents. But when we're in the international arena, most of us, like I said, except for one party, we stick together because it's a it's a national, it's a nation, and that's something that uh, a lot of a lot of different members of the interparliamentary union have commanded the Turkish group. I mean, I hope we go that way. But we try, we are able to harmonize, come together, negotiate, yes. agree on common ground. This is challenging, but for bureaucrats, yeah. when you're a bureaucrat, you ha what you give is there is not much room for flexibility. Whatever your position has to be the government's position, nothing more, nothing less. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Astrid Nadia. Could you please unmute yourself and answer your question? Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Please proceed. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator, for giving the floor. And thank you, uh, Dr. Ravza, for the uh, explanation on parliamentary diplomacy. Uh, before going to the question, I'd like to answer uh, about the uh, representative of Indonesia in IPU. So actually, uh, recently, 
there were two from Indonesia. First is uh, Mr. Fadli Zon on the human rights. And second is Ms. Putri Aneta Komarudin, the chair of Asia Pacific. And both are from coalition uh, of the government. And uh, coming to the question, uh, balance of power is significant on parliamentary diplomacies. What is the limit of balancing others' power? And to what extent parliament should limit the government? Thank you so much. May I, let me see if I understood the question right. You're talking about balance of power and to what limit? Could you repeat uh, that part? Yeah. So uh, in terms of diplomacy, uh, there are two uh, main actors. First is the executive and second is legislative. In this case, uh, is the parliament. And as you uh, explained and mentioned uh, that uh, sometimes in international forums, the uh, MP uh, might uh, speak in a provocative manner uh, because perhaps they're from the coalition or they don't uh, really agree with the executive, in this case, the uh, government or those in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, are doing. Uh, so my question is, uh, what, to what extent the parliament uh, should limit the government in terms of diplomacy and uh, to uh, certain policies? Uh, of course, a, a balance of power is an important perspective. So there needs to be a balance of power I I domestically, internally, and in the international arena as well. Uh, that is important. And uh, of course, whatever the executive says, uh, when you're representing the uh, ruling party especially, whatever is the position of your government, the position of your party is something that affects you. Actually, uh, that is the, uh, I will I will link it to the question that wasn't asked when uh, Brother Muiz Islam from Afghanistan asked the question. I, I, I thought he was going to say, what is it like to be a member of parliament and civilian? Of course, that's maybe a very trivial question to all of you, but this is one of the things that's important for me, for instance, I'm an activist. I'm always, I was always a part of protests, you know, for instance, on the issue of Palestine. We would be, my colleagues and I, if there was an important issue, of course, that's an important issue and it's close to our heart. Uh, I would be the, one of the ones who takes place uh, as a part of the activist protesters. But as a member of parliament, I need to do Another different form of diplomacy now. I may not be able to go with my friends and take the flags and uh, maybe have banners or signs. But what I do is in every single platforms, I did that in IPU meetings, no matter what the topic is, I also mention, make sure I mention Palestine. That's also, that goes with my government's position. Also, it goes with the, Thank God in Turkey, that's one, one of the issues that all parties in the parliament agree on because they, we signed the common declaration. So in the international arena, that's something I also, uh, you know, I may not, it's not as exciting as going to a protest at late night, but that's another form of diplomacy we do in the international arena. Of course, uh, we don't feel bound by the, by the position of the government. We are, like I said, we're more flexible, but still we, that is one of the things that keeps uh, the majority of our group in speaking of personal experience. That's how we keep a similar position. Maybe if we were in Turkey, we would be disagreeing domestically on certain positions. But when we're in the international arena, because it's an international issue, it's an, it becomes a national issue, not a domestic issue, then we we, we tend to stick together. Or we may have opposition saying, we don't agree, but we will, we will go, we'll vote with you. We'll go together with the vote. Uh, maybe our personal positions may be different, but uh, we do not, we still, uh, we still consider our national position, all parties do, but we still have uh, some flexibility on that. 
and we're we're members of parliament so we do have our own personal opinion as well but all the time we are we need to consider the fact that we are representing our own party but more importantly we're representing our nation so uh, we we make sure when we disagree uh, we don't do it in front of everybody we try our best sometimes that doesn't happen but uh, we 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 in our, within our group we talk about the issues we talk about the government's position and then and then we give a official position of our group uh, but it is it is challenging sometimes to keep that balance Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Fatih Doan Oral. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, hi, I'm audible right now. Yes. Yeah, you are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim, for this great thanks and moderation. Greetings from Ankara. Uh, sorry for the noise. I couldn't go home due to the traffic. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, dear Dr. Kawakchi, before my question, I would like to present my personal special thanks to you. Your, valu your valuable experiences and knowledge shared with us uh, are unique uh, guided guides. Uh, your Excellency, as a witness of uh, different unfortunate crisis per periods, uh, I would like to know about especially those unf uh, unfortunate experiences and how to connect them with the notion of democracy. Uh, when it comes to the question, finally, uh, what will be the advantages of parliamentary democracy in crisis periods? Thank you. Uh, I hope I understood uh, your question right. First of all, I know Ankara, I mean, I, I'm a member of parliament from Istanbul. Uh, us Istanbul people love go, running back to Istanbul when the parliament is over. But this morning, I drove from Ankara to Istanbul. Ankara, interestingly, has a crazy traffic I couldn't figure it out. I mean, in Istanbul, we're used to traffic. It's a part of our life, but we see the bridge, we see this, as we pass the bridge, we see the view, we're like, okay, it's okay, you know, we, I can handle it. But in Ankara, there is a different uh, traffic as well, so I'm, I can't figure it out. I really can't. So uh, I, hope, I hope you go to get to home uh, safe and sound. I hope I uh, ex uh, understood the question uh, right. Uh, you were, um, so are we talking about challenging times, how parliamentary diplomacy works or, or bad experience at uh, maybe uh, challenging experiences we had? So I'm both of them. <laughs> uh, actually, both of them, uh, but the second part uh, will be great for me. Okay, all right. I think I just made the question more difficult. Okay, talking too much is not a good thing, but asking too many questions is not a good thing for me. But, but it's okay. Uh, setting the joke aside, of course, um, for instance, pandemic. Uh, the COVID pandemic made us realize how interdependent and interconnected we are, right? As the global community, there are certain issues like environment, we say we act very selfishly on these issues. I'm sorry to say, I will admit it, uh, as the global community, we're very selfish on certain issues like human rights, democracy. We give each other's lessons and we teach each other lessons. We try to, I and mean, when I say we, I'm talking about everybody, but then we see the ones who are giving, trying to give, teach lessons to the others are the ones who don't care about human rights, or they care about certain human rights. Uh, so this pandemic made us realize that as the global community, we're interconnected, we're interdependent. We will not all be well unless every single human being on this earth is well. So if we continue, if we don't take our lesson and we continue to act selfishly, we will all suffer together ah if we take our lesson if those of us who uh, those of those nations who have um who unfortunately uh, use their power on the less powerful ones or those who abuse the resources of less powerful nations will all suffer because, you know, with the pandemic made us realize, right? It's a small, small thing that we can 
let's see. It's a humbling experience. I mean, as a, as a, as someone, uh, as a, let me say, as a spiritual, at a spiritual level, uh, God taught us a lesson. We had all our plans. We were going to do this. We had, I mean, I had all these international meetings. I was having a difficulty keeping up with my with schedule. And I'm sure all of you had great, me, uh, uh, great, uh, wonderful, wonderful, great plans to do wonderful things or even having going to a holiday with your family, maybe. What happened? None of us could leave our homes. We may have, we may be looking forward to going places. We weren't able to do that. So, and also at, at the international level, we realize as a global community, well, we can close our borders, but we're interdependent. We need to do trade. So all our economy and all our health systems. So it, it was, it, it was a, uh, such a challenge. But of course, this is one of the very unfortunate times we're living as human beings. And uh, I hope as humanity, we take our lesson. We learn not to abuse each other and listen to each other, not talk at each other or talk down to each other because we're equal. It doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter what ethnicity we are. It doesn't matter what language we speak. It doesn't matter how we believe, whether we do or not. We are all equal. So we should Hopefully, globally, we will recognize that this this should be one of the good uh, good lessons we take away from the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, what happened? It's a time of crisis, right? It's not like war, but it's war against this. Uh, it's a health war, let me say, against this thing that we don't see. So I'll give you the Turkish experience. The parliament didn't stop working. And we see that in the IPU as well. Most parliaments were working. But what we had is we took some of the meetings, we took them online. But as the Turkish parliament, we looked at what we need, what do we need? We, by the way, we're, we're very dynamic in that way, I need to say. Um, so what we did was we re realized we need first some economic support in order so we can provide better health care. So the parliament was in session constantly. We had members of parliament who got sick. So our friends would get sick. We all get tested. We continue working. So uh, we got criticized a lot for keeping the parliament running, but that's what the people need. So that's what we did. It was a challenging time, but that's what we did in our parliament. Another example for Turkish cases, of course, July 15th, the coup attempt. Uh, you know, that is, uh, I mean, I won't go into too much details of that, but that's another way we did our soft diplomacy as well. So what we did was the grand, all, all of you know, I'm sure, but I'll give you just a sentence summary. So the Grand National Assembly was one of the places that got attacked. Okay, it is where the nation's, nation's representatives are. They're there. So they were there. I was in Istanbul, but I went back. And uh, after the Grand National Assembly during the coup attempt in uh, on July 15, 2016, after the Grand National Assembly got attacked, a few hours after that, we were in session. All parties were there. That's another good thing. Even the parties who would less likely agree on anything. So we were all there because this was a national issue. And our parliament had just been bombed. There was glass everywhere outside the parliamentary chamber, but we were there. So at the time of crisis, I think parliaments need to be, this had a symbolic meaning. We didn't have any emergency, emergency law that needed to be passed at that time. It was around the time that parliament was about to go out of session because it was July, so for two month break. But we were in session. We kept the parliament running during that period to show the Turkish nation that the parliament is working. We're there in case there's any emergency law that needs to be passed. It was a way of giving message. And this was very valuable for the Turkish nation. Uh, we had some unfortunate experiences as well in the international arena. In, at one point, in, uh, for instance, in, uh, during an IPU General Assembly, uh, the discussion came to uh, a name of a leader of terrorist organization that's recognized 
the PKK terrorist organization, which is recognized probably by uh, all the countries that are being represented here. It's an international rec ter recognized terrorist organization. But during the IPU meeting, uh, a member of parliament from uh, another country decided to talk about uh, the leader of a terrorist organization, of the terrorist organization PKK. And as the parliamentary group, we had to leave that session. And we left it, uh, except for one member. We left together with most of my colleagues in the opposition. And we said that we have to, we're sorry, we have to leave in protest because this is no place where a leader of a terrorist organization should be discussed. This is the space for parliamentary diplomacy. This is not a space where there should be propaganda related with terrorist organizations. So these are these are a little challenging. You know, you don't want to upset anybody. So sometimes that is why uh, my colleagues in the IPU, sometimes they see me as the troublemaker. But uh, that's, uh, I don't think that's something that had happened in that platform before. But these are the things that are challenging. You need to decide when to take a certain position. Uh, we are we are flexible. We're more understanding. But there are certain issues that maybe are red line that you do not, you cannot let anybody disrespect your nation, your parliament. Because if if you if you're there as a civilian, maybe it's okay. If they say sorry, it's okay. But all of us are representing our national assembly. So if somebody did, does something that's disrespectful, then you need to act in a way uh, that is still diplomatic diplomatically acceptable, but uh, you need to also give your message to make sure that uh, you do not allow any kind of disrespectful or unacceptable behavior that's related with your nation's interests. So that's the challenge. I hope it wasn't too long of an answer. Oh, thank you. I'm sure the traffic is gone by now. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Amina Kahriman. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and greetings to everyone. My name is Amina Kahriman and I am country coordinator for Model OIC from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so actually my question is connected to youth. Uh, how do you evaluate the involvement of the youth in the decision-making processes as parliament members? Thank you so much. Wa alaikum salam. I'm glad we, I thought we lost you at some point. I'm glad you're back. I was curious. Very, very important question. Uh, so uh, involvement of youth, I will say uh, on a personal level as well, but uh, the IPU also has a movement called Yes to Youth in Parliament. Uh, we're supportive of that and uh, as, as the Turkish group as well. And I'm uh, very, very excited to say on a personal note that I love uh, having youth in the parliament. And uh, it's because maybe I feel like I'm getting old and I like being around young people. But uh, having youth, parliaments should be places where you, there is a reflection of the society, right? So in Turkey, for instance, I don't know if it's the same thing in your national parliaments or nations as well. Um, there is a, this imagination or there is this um, idea of a member of parliament that they, they are from a certain background, uh, they need to have a certain socioeconomic position, they need to be of a certain knowledge level. Uh, no, I think all parts of different aspects of societies should be represented in the parliament. So some of us have very good academic backgrounds, some of us don't. Some of us have dealt with trade, are good tradespeople, are good businessmen, businesswomen, some of us are not. Uh, some of us had uh, a very easy life as far as economic situation is concerned. Some of us had difficult economic lives before we became uh, and maybe continue as members of parliament. So there is no standard. And also 
just like all parts of society, all parts of socioeconomic group, all parts of different ethnic groups, religious groups, all different um, groups in the societies should be represented in the parliament. Youth needs to be represented as well. I'll give you an example from the Turkish parliament. Uh, until 2017, when we had the referendum, uh, until then, uh, people, uh, the age to get elected was 25. First, it was 30. Then it was it was brought down to 25, and I will, I will, I will do some political advertising here. It was, uh, oh, I got too excited and all of a say, uh, sudden almost lost my screen. But uh, I will, I'll do some political, uh, I won't be humble about that. It was my party. It was uh, under the leadership pres of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan that Turkey went through a great change where we, uh, we, decreased their age to get elected from 30 to 25 and in 2017 it got reduced to the age of 18. So people between the ages of 18 to 25 in Turkey, they constitute 10 percent of our population, were able to elect, they were able to decide on the future of their country, but they weren't represented. I think that was very unfair very unfair. So it was one of the most exciting items on our agenda when we had that constitutional change. And uh, now youth is also represented. And I'm proud to say the youngest member of parliament uh, in, uh, in our National Assembly and also one of the youngest in the world that was recognized by IPU is Rumeysa Kadak. She's at the same age as probably some of you, same age as my daughter. And it's a great honor to serve in the National Assembly with her. So whenever it's something uh, related with youth, and I know that it's a lot of responsibility on her shoulders, she, she's like, she, she may sometimes feel like she needs to answer everything related with youth. But Rumey Sakadak is one of them, Zeynep Yildiz is another one. So we have, uh, I think, about... Uh, eight, nine members, it's not uh, enough under the age of Turkey in our parliament. So we need to increase that number because youth is a part of our society and they should be able to have a say on issues. We, we should be able to hear their voice. So I find it very, very important. Uh, so I'm, that's why I'm excited. And I think uh, I, would, I would love to leave my seat to a young member of parliament any day. So that's how I excited I am about having youth in the parliament. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to, to be here on today's session. Thank you, same for me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we received a lot of questions via the chat box, but due to time constraints, I would like to read one question addressed to our esteemed guest speaker. The question came from Ms. Balkis Amira. Uh, the question is as follows. Do you face any kind of gender discrimination as a woman in the parliament? Uh, Alhamdulillah, I didn't. Thank God I didn't. But of course, uh, it's I, my, my bachelor's degree is in engineering. When I was uh, attending university in Dallas, Texas, in some classes, like calculus class, I remember we had a very difficult professor, Dr. Esparza. I don't know what, I hope he's alive and he's well. Uh, so in his class, I was the only girl. So he would say, guys, did you understand? And he would turn to me, Ravza, did you understand? I mean, I don't know. He was just being a gentleman, not, not uh, including me within the guys. But uh, so it's not, it's not easy in the world. And this is a global challenge. Uh, being, uh, uh, it's because it's a mostly a male dominated area. But again, I'm in Turkey and I'm not saying it out of politics. I'm saying it sincerely. We have a wonderful leader who opens the way, who fights for the rights and representation rights of women and youth. And you know, women are always young. So we get, we get someone who is fighting for us, for, who is ruling for us twice so uh that is one of the things that we have uh we're lucky we're extremely lucky to have but it's not easy in the international arena 
because I'm a woman, and sometimes because I'm a woman wearing the headscarf, that may be that may be uh, poor. That may be um, sometimes that may be there are situations where we are faced with uh, discrimination, but it's nothing we cannot deal with. Uh, I think if as women and men we come together. And we support each other. Of course, we may have our individual uh, differences, uh, different points of view, maybe disagreements. But uh, if we support each other, uh, I think there's n- there's nothing we cannot resolve. Uh, so, I, I, personally, I make a point to make sure that if there's other women members of parliament, that's something, like I said, IPU gives importance to as well, and that's something we support in the Green National Assembly as well. Like I said, we have 600 members of parliament in the Turkish Grand National Assembly, 104 are women, 54 are from our party. Thank you so much, Doctor, distinguished guests, dear respected viewers, audience participants, Having come to the end of our today's session on behalf of the ICF Secretariat, I would like to seize this opportunity to express our gratitude to our esteemed Dr. Ravza Kavakchi for the informative and productive session. We hope to see you again very soon, inshallah. I also would like to reflect my deep gratitude to all the participants and also the ICF team whose commitment and personal involvement enabled this discussion to achieve its objectives. And lastly, I would also like to conclude by wishing you the best in the upcoming sessions. Happy evening and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, wa alaikum salam. Uh, may I say one last word? Of course, sure. The place Thank you. Uh, I hope and pray that all of you uh, are well. Uh, please give our best wishes to your families. Keep us in your prayers, inshallah. Inshallah, uh, we will hopefully be able to feast, uh, meet face to face next time. Thank you. Inshallah, thank you so much, Dr. Ramza Thank you.